Hey everyone, welcome back to Female Founder World. I'm Jasmine Garnsworthy, I'm the host of the show. And I'm chatting with Olivia Deramas today. She's the founder of an app called Communia. They are a consumer social media app that is created for women and marginalized genders. And it's basically a really inclusive, safe, progressive space for folks to connect on just like more taboo topics that aren't really allowed or are kind of more regulated on your more traditional social media platforms, like maybe an Instagram or a TikTok. So there's lots of content on there around like money and sex and mental health. And she's got a really interesting story about how she got this off the ground and gets super tactical about how she got those first 100,000 downloads on Communia. If you're someone who is just like generally curious about how you get traction on an app and how you monetize an app, I feel like this is a really good episode. She also shares some ways to get started if maybe you don't have like a ton of capital to throw at a consumer tech product. She's got some good ideas about how to kind of, you know, get proof of concept in a really, really scrappy way. Okay, let's jump in. You are now entering Female Founder World with your host, Jasmine Garnsworthy. Olivia, welcome to Female Founder World. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. For people who haven't used Communia before, what are you guys building? So we are a social networking app and self-development platform for women and marginalized genders. People come to us um, to work on and talk about uh, different self-development topics, but self-development, I think, in a much more real way. So that includes topics around Me Too, mental health, sex, relationships, money, pretty much everything you wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable being honest about and seeking advice on platforms like Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Okay, we're going to dive into and like really focus this episode on how you build and launch an app and all the nitty gritty of what's involved. Usually we speak to a lot of like e-commerce and consumer brands, but I think a lot of folks in our community are also really interested in this space. But we're also going to talk about community building, which is literally applicable to anyone who is building a business, I think, and something that everyone can learn from you because it's something that you're doing so, so well. I wanted to call out a milestone that I just think will help people place where you're at now. You have nearly 50,000 followers on Instagram. You've had 100,000 downloads, which is awesome. And that's kind of at the point of like where you guys are in your story. Is there anything else that you can kind of like help people understand where Communia is at right now? Yeah, I think in terms of traction, especially, we've gotten a lot of great press coverage. We were pretty lucky mm-hmm. early on. We've been covered in platforms like People, um, Harper's Bazaar, TechCrunch even. Let's see what else. We recently monetized a portion of the app that I can talk about awesome. at some point potentially, which is essentially a suite of elevated community-oriented self-care tools. And so unlike other apps, we've actually monetized very, very early on. Very cool. Okay. So let's like start back in the early days. I want to understand what was happening just really quickly, why you decided that there needed to be a place on the internet like Communia. What was your kind of, okay, I'm going to go and build this thing moment. Yeah. um, That's a great question. And uh, the answer is a a little bit of a ride. So I'm going (laughs) to take your listeners on a bit of a story. I am an untraditional founder. I am not from the tech world. I never wanted to be a founder. I essentially, it all happened in college, really. I had a pretty difficult experience where I was actually sexually assaulted. And unfortunately, the kind of story doesn't really end there. Though I was found in the right by the university when I reported, I was actually, I was sued by the perpetrator of my assault for defamation. And so for many years, I couldn't tell anyone that I was a survivor, what was happening to me, that my abuser was still victimizing me. And I was silenced. And I really had to figure out how I was going to feel empowered again, because I realized that the courts were not going to protect me, even though the truth is on my side, something that I think too many Americans have to have to realize Mm -hmm. at, at certain points in their lives. And when I was able to kind of come through the other side, I really had a choice. I could pursue personal justice with the legal fund that I had, or I could try to create a tool that could help other people in similar positions. And really in what I noticed where even if I could have talked about what was happening to me, there was no way that I could have spoken about it on a platform like Instagram or Twitter and said, hey, 
you know, this is something really serious that's happening to me. I would love support, advice, and, and connection to other people going through a hard time, right? I would have been met with trolling and, and any number of, of the many issues that exist on mainstream social media platforms. So <laughs> that's a bit of an explosive story behind community. Wow. <laughs> I'm so sorry that happened to you. And what a gift that you have created for everyone else out of that, that awful experience that you've had, because you really have created this like beautiful, warm, safe space on the internet. I love the app and the community that you're creating over there. Thank you so much. Yes, it's been uh, a true labor of love. It's certainly been interesting becoming a founder kind of right after that pretty traumatic experience, because I think... I really fell into that trap that I think a lot of founders fall into for a while is your business becomes your identity. Um, and yeah. so I've definitely Oof. done, I, I could write a whole book, honestly, about, you know, a healthy, I'd read it. healthy mindset, health, healthy emotional boundaries uh, around even being a founder. Cause I definitely, I fell into all those traps and have only really in the past couple of months kind of come out of it. And I, I feel like being able to have a healthy relationship with, with my business. Yeah, absolutely. That resonates for sure. It's hard to separate yourself from your business when you're in it and it means so much to you. Okay. So I want to talk about actually launching an app. How it's okay. I feel like, first of all, I hear tech bros talking about this on tech podcasts all the time. And they're like, yeah, we just like built an app and then made a million dollars. And it just, I'm like, <laughs> how, how do you, how do you create an app? How do you build like a really simple MVP to test if you don't have a lot of funding? And then how do you evolve that into a more sophisticated platform? What was your process? Yeah. So as I mentioned, I'm not from the tech industry. My degree was in international relations. I worked in nonprofits. So I am not a technical founder. And I think a lot of people really get discouraged. It, it, uh, there's this narrative, I think, that's very pervasive that um, basically you can't be a tech founder, you can't be build an app if you don't know how to code. And that's just not true. And that's also thanks to a lot of the innovations that have been happening with white label apps, right? There are a lot mm -hmm. of no code platforms that you can use to test out your idea. And that's certainly what we did at the start, right? Because actually Communia did start life a little bit as an editorial platform, right? When we just launched, I was just building the community first, you know, building our Instagram, publishing stories. And when I revealed that to the people I was working with and to our community at the time that I wanted to build an app and that's really where, where this was going, uh, everyone thought we were crazy. And so I was unsure, but I was able to test it out with these white label platforms that are very cost effective um, and not have to put in a ton of money up front before I even knew that this was something that people would actually go to. So I think thanks to that alone, there are so many more opportunities for, I think, people who wouldn't traditionally be in the tech space to to enter and, and start creating and building their own digital worlds, which I'm just, I'm so excited about. And it's actually something that community is getting into a little bit. Now that we've built our own community platform, something I haven't talked about yet is that we're actually open to licensing the core community aspects of our app to other people, other businesses who want a little bit of an elevated white label experience, but still don't want to take that full step into development. Because uh, definitely once you get towards there, uh, over there, it's it, yeah, it's, a, it's an inexpensive process. So you definitely want to be testing it out. We tested for about a year, I would say. So we, we, we took our time for sure. When you want to find uh, a platform to white label, like what's the process of doing that? Is this a Google search? Are there like agencies that help you do this? How do you find something? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, Google is amazing. I mean, Google does not get utilized enough. They're, they're really all there. They're, they're quite loud and, and getting louder. I think what I would tell founders who are even in like a consumer space, aren't in the app space and just want their own community app. And just anyone, no matter what they're doing, if they're looking into this, just be really careful about hidden fees, right? And so just ask a lot of questions about hidden fees, I think, and the terms and what that eventual exit might look like when you are ready to build your own app from the ground up, all your own IP, all your own code. Because while it is a great tool, there are certain companies who are less flexible than others there. And 
will have hidden issues arise. So it's really important that you do a lot of interrogation, uh, even though there are these options that are ready, readily available to you. So I would say proceed with, with excitement, but also with a little bit of caution as well, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. What kind of milestones were you hitting or like what insights had you gleaned from your white labeled app that made you then decide to go forward and build something yourself from scratch? Yeah. So we had about 30,000 downloads by the time I really felt confident about building our own, our own app. And we also had a lot of activity on the app. We had people commenting, people posting. It wasn't an anxiety for us to know, oh, is there going to be enough activity on the app today? So I think that if you don't have to force engagement, if people are really, Mm. you know, doing the actions that you want them to do uh, without you having to do a lot of encouragement and a lot of reminding, that's a really good kind of qualitative data point for you. I would also like not be afraid to learn about data. I'm very data oriented. I never used to be before getting into this business. But again, I think women are told that data is hard and that if you don't have a background in it, you can't understand it. No, I think once you wrap your head around it, once you really dig into it, it's actually quite straightforward. And again, a lot of these white labeling apps really have these tools that make it very, very easy. So don't not look at things like data just because society has told us that it's intimidating because it's, it's actually quite accessible once you're there. We're going to talk about how you actually get users on an app in a second, but I want to um, keep talking about this like building process. When you, when it comes to building your own app from scratch and you're a non-technical founder, what kind of ballpark budget are people looking at to build something? How do you find the right partners? What are the, like, what are the steps to do this? Yeah. So what the average quote that we got when we were first looking into making a, an extremely basic version of what is out in app stores today. So yeah, I want to caveat this with where we're at now is not where we were when we first launched Mm -hmm. Communia from the ground up, right? So we started with a, a, a much more simpler version. So that we were quoted by a number of people for around 60 to 80,000 for that baseline version. So and I would, I would also say it's, it's always 10% higher than they say it's going to be for any project when it, when it comes to, to building in the app space. So, so it's always 10% higher than what they actually quote you. So if you're really exceeding your budget, I would proceed with caution. That being said, once you have that baseline, you can take your time in building the next ideas that you have, the next iterations. You don't have to have everything figured out at that moment. I think we see a lot of overnight successes or we perceive to, that, that there are a lot of overnight successes around, even especially in the tech space. And that's not true. You can absolutely take your time. We've taken our time. And I think we've really benefited because you know, we have had small, small budgets for the tech space. We have been really scrappy. We have had to be really thoughtful about our choices due to budget, but it's actually allowed us to make less mistakes than other people in this space. When you're building an app like this, when do you decide this is now the right time to monetize it? I know some apps launch right away. You pay, you know, a monthly or a weekly fee to subscribe to it. Other apps introduce paid tiers later on. How did you figure out when the right time was? Yeah. So I love this question because I really do wish that we had done it um, earlier. It's Mm. very intimidating, I think, to start charging when you have a community-based business, but um, our community really reacted so well to it. And actually our conversion rates have gone up. Our ads have become cheaper all since we started charging for a portion of the app. And so that's been very, very interesting to see. I think for us, we're in a unique position because we are a social network, but we are a social network that's out to create a healthier social media environment, a safer one. And so that includes things like a real commitment to data privacy in the ways that other platforms like Facebook don't. So we'll never allow any type of paid advertising on the app and we'll never sell user data. But that is how big tech and any most tech companies, startups, whatever, make their money. So we're really having to prove to the tech world, to the VC world, that you can be a 
wildly successful, profitable business without taking advantage of people like that. And so I really wanted to show early on that we can create added value features that add to our users' lives and, and be this really scalable business. And I think we only launched that paid portion of the app in October with that element of community itself, our customizable social, private, and collaborative journaling, uh, as well as goal tracking and mood boards, so many things to come. But we're already seeing amazing growth with that and are feeling really, really good about 2023 financially. But really to answer, to fully circle back to your question, I think that it just depends on your situation. I definitely, in the beginning, you know, back in 2019 when we first started, I saw, you know, the companies that had come before me, well, they were really, you know, waiting for an IPO. They were just taking tons of VC funding and, and, and really had no clear way of, uh, of, of making money. And so for the first year or so, I thought, oh, maybe I should try to bet on that. But I think yep. when you are taking a stance, and I think nowadays any up and coming business needs to take a stance to, to be able to stand out. You need to prove very early on that you can do it, that you're not just full of hot air, that your idea is right. And unfortunately, especially for women, we have so much more to prove to the entire world, right? So for us, we decided to go for it pretty early as far as tech is concerned, but I think you just need to follow your intuition. and. Other people's timeline doesn't need to be your timeline. Yeah, I think it's, I think there's a lot of pressure and it's just listening to your gut. I love that. I love your mission of like, okay, let's just turn this on its head. Social media is broken. Let's stop, you know, exploiting our users and using their data and let's find another model that works. So I really hope that it works and that you guys are able to show the rest of the world, hey, like maybe we can do this a little bit more thoughtfully and a little bit more with a little bit more consideration. You mentioned before, like uh, your ad costs coming down uh, as you introduce the monetized platform. And I want to understand how you actually get users in, in this like tech space. We speak to a lot of consumer founders who have different funnels that help them get, you know, their first customers and traffic to their website. How is it different when you're trying to funnel something through to like an app download? Yeah. So this is another great question. I think there are a lot of similarities. I think like any business, it really helps if you have an existing community. So our Instagram following in particular was, you know, really, really strong by the time we launched even the beta version of, of the app, right? With just that white label version, we were testing it out. And so all of that organic conversation that was already happening on Instagram was very easy to then transfer over to the app um, because even then before people were really catching on, right? I know, especially the past couple of weeks, everyone's hating on Twitter. It's great to see mm -hmm. culturally, everyone's getting them at really understanding the, the evils of big tech. But even before then, because we were already having those conversations and our community was already complaining that Instagram was such a poor place to have those conversations, it was very, very easy for us to then upsell them to download the app. So we certainly had an unfair advantage at the start. You know, we also we also do Instagram ads, right? We also do paid ads. I think paid ads get like such a bad rap these days, but I think if you're very careful with your content and you're very respectful of the people who are going to be seeing those paid ads, that they can be very effective and they've certainly been effective for us especially because I have been hesitant to get into the influencer space just because we're not trying to be a cool brand. We're trying to be a friendly brand for everyone and every woman is oh, not buying yeah. person. Yeah. So that's the thing. If we had relied on influencers outside the gate, you know, the influencers we would have chosen would have really sent a message about the kind of person that we were targeting when in reality we want everyone. And so while I would love to get into influencer marketing more in 2023, that's something I've actually been quite cautious about just because of, I think when you're building a social network in particular, it's different from a traditional consumer brand where you really have a specific girl in mind, but actually, especially for Communia, you know, we're talking about things like me too, mental health, like you don't have to have a certain aesthetic uh, to be a community girl, to want to support others, to need help in return, right? So that's really why we, yeah, we've really leaned into paid advertising again. So we don't accidentally say, oh, well, this is only for one type of girl. 
And also really leaning into TikTok, Instagram, and all of that authentic, organic engagement that we already had through that community. And also not being afraid, again, to, to take a stance and really say what we stand for. So I think, I think a lot of similarities, but I think the whole influencer marketing issue is probably the biggest key difference for us. Super interesting. Is there anything that you did right on launch that you think drove a lot of traction? How did you announce that you now had an app available to download and like what worked around that announcement? Oh my gosh. So this is like now actually over two years ago. So this was, this is actually a really long time ago now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So different times. Let me think, you know, even then again, I, I came into this business like fully not prepared. So I'll be honest with you, two years ago, our marketing strategy was in no way like it right now. I'm really proud of it. It's very tight. It's very professional. But yeah, two years ago, honestly, you guys know (laughs) it wasn't. And I think what I really credit it to is that we were really one of the first people, one of the first businesses or groups really trying to do a a project like this. And so people were really shocked. And also we launched it only a few months into lockdown. So it was actually very interesting timing that we really caught this wave of lockdown, people being isolated. And also the fact that this was a surprising thing to do at the time. I think now there are Mm. more and more community apps, more and more up and coming social networks, which I'm very excited about. But really back then, yeah, we were one of very few organizations doing, doing the things that we were, that we were doing. And then I guess the last thing on that I would say is, you know, we're not afraid to swear in our content. We're not afraid to to dive deep in the way that other brands tend to avoid. So that I think I credit, I credit that being able to, to speak like that to people with, with a lot of our marketing success. How have you been funding all this? It sounds like building something as sophisticated as community. I've obviously spent a lot of time on the app and there's a lot of work that's gone into that. Have you raised money? Did you bootstrap in the beginning? Talk me through how you're how you're funding this whole venture. Yeah, so we're we're mostly bootstrapped. Um, as I mentioned uh, previously, <laughs> I had a legal fund and through that typical experience, and I could have used that money to, yeah, pursue justice for myself or use that dwindling pot to, to start communion. And that's ultimately mm. what has funded the, the majority of the business. We do now have uh, a private investor who is really passionate about the social mission of the company in particular, obviously recognizes the financial potential, but for me, it's really important that any outside investors that we bring in are just as passionate about our social impact as they are about the financial opportunity. I think, you know, in the VC space, it's it's normal for there to be issues when you bring in VC funding, like that's what they are. Like they want money. That is their bottom line. They don't really care about helping people. And so I've been really cautious on purpose in involving outside funding because I want to make sure that our partners, our financial partners, yes, we all want to make money. I, I, I don't think that's a bad thing to say, even as a social impact business, yes. but- that can't be to the detriment of our users and our user well-being, or else, you know, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Um, there'd, there'd be no point. So we are quite cautious about that, though we are bringing on, you know, outside investors increasingly here and there. But we're we're a lot slower than than other people, and the reason that we're able to do that is because actually <laughs> I'm still one of the only full-time team members at Communia, which is shocking to a lot of people, and I think really speaks to the power of scrappiness and being creative and a lot of amazing long-term freelancers that we work with. And yeah, I'm not afraid to say that. Uh, and I'm, and I'm very proud that we come across, like we have a, a much bigger team than, than we do. And our development, our, our developer team is just amazing. And I've just been so lucky to find the, the right partners and the right people who believe in this mission, who honestly have allowed us to develop an app at a much cheaper rate than we ever would have otherwise. We really, we really lucked out on people and, and that's how we've been able to grow so much and, and become such a sophisticated app without, you know, VC funding, which generally 
a lot of people have to rely on. I mean, everyone tends to have to rely on that. It's, it's an imperfect system, but we've, we've yeah. really lucked out for sure. Amazing. And then the last thing that I ask everyone who comes on the show is for a resource. And that can be literally anything that's helped you as you've been building your business and up-leveling as an entrepreneur and a leader. What do you think folks should go and check out? I have recently discovered this platform called Every, and it basically gets all of these random different newsletters that you wouldn't necessarily come across. And puts them all into your inbox. It it doesn't spam you, but they basically curate it for you. And that's been really helpful for me, especially with, you know, the, the fact that all this Twitter news, all of these, all of these things in the tech space have really been blowing up. And it's like, you can, you can barely catch your breath in the tech space right now with, with all the news that's happening. And it is so exhausting. Yeah. I can't. Yeah, I I spend hours of my time reading the latest mess, right, that Elon Musk has created. (laughs) And and, and, I mean, so much more, right? So, but every, I've I've loved having them because this is, this sounds like an ad, it's not. They've just been very helpful. Uh, Again, in staying super informed with the the industry that that I'm in without having to subscribe to every single publication, every, every single website. So that's been super helpful in particular right now. Amazing. Olivia, thank you so much for coming on Female Founder World and congratulations on everything you're building at Communia. We love to see it. Thank you so much for having me. Hey everyone, Jasmine again. Thank you for tuning in to that episode of the Female Founder World podcast. If you loved it and you loved Olivia, like I do, she is honestly just like such an inspiring founder. I'm a big fan of Communia. I use the app Aesthetically, it is just so, so beautiful. You should actually check out their Instagram feed as well um, just to get a feel for like the branding and the vibe because I feel like they're the best out there right now in terms of branding and content and it's just really worth looking at for your own inspiration. But if you did enjoy it, take a screenshot. Share this episode on your Instagram stories and tag me at Jasmine Garnsworthy and tag the pod at Be My Founder World and I'll be sure to repost it. Okay, guys, chat to you next time.